Hi, everybody. Thank you again for joining us for this latest installment of the Climate Engagement Series. Um, I'm Jennifer Harvey Senna. You all have seen me by now and know me by now. I have this very interesting operation that is I Heart Earth, which is this exploratory process of getting together important voices uh, and teachings on how to engage with the climate um, in a conscious way and reconnect with our ecological selves in this complex natural world that we that we live in. <clears throat> so today I'm very happy to have Kelly Isabel DeMarco with us. And um, she is a climate change coach, a climate action coach and catalyst, and many, many other things, which we're going to find out a, a bit more about today. Um, occupational therapist is one of the main hats that she wears. And so she has a very interesting approach that um, combines like planning, climate action planning, we're gonna talk about that, and this very conscious awareness of um, mindfully engaging and, uh, and sort of, you know, slow living and this, this other side of things that's, you know, sort of career and personal really closely together. And right now she's in the process of um, starting a, a climate engagement, um, I, I don't know how you'd say it exactly, but a climate engagement or climate action course for women. And so we chose the theme of our discussion today to be about regenerative uh, activism and agency for women. So I'm happy to talk about that because I looked around and it doesn't seem like too many people are talking specifically about that topic. So I'm excited to learn from you, Kelly, today. Thanks for being here. Good. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And for everyone who's here listening, I really just want to welcome you and thank you for taking the time to just show up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to, as I always do, start these calls with a little bit of a bio about your background, Kelly. You can correct me if, I'm, if I've got any of the details wrong. We've talked about it, but sometimes, uh, yeah. you know, things get lost in translation. But um, <clears throat> then I will, you know, give us a starting point to then deepen the discussion about your journey as a woman, as an activist, and moving from a sort of Mm, unsustainable activist uh, mentality and engagement mentality to a uh, slow living mentality that uh, is focused on regenerative activism. So uh, one cool thing, well, we have a lot of interesting things that are in common. So I grew up in Michigan in the US and you grew up in Wisconsin, just next door in the US. And uh, very similar to you, I grew up in a small town, Midwest, you know, white Christian uh, area and was also in pursuit, as you say, of the extraordinary. I needed to get out of there and find diversity. The way you described it on one of your websites is like diversity in landscapes, diversity in cultures, diversity in spiritual practices, diversity in everything, place, uh, you know, anything that was different. And I was totally the same. Uh, so that was always calling to me. And so that pulled me away from the US. And for you, it pulled you away from the US as well. So you did a lot of traveling and what you described as endurance quests, uh, physically, emotionally, <laughs> relationally, all the way through, as a lot of us do, I think that, are, you know, have that strong wanderlust and need to go find uh, the extraordinary out there in the world whatever that means for each of us. There's a lot of, I think, endurance quest that goes into that kind of, you know, internal drive. Um, so what that led to in your case, and it's such an interesting and unique calling was being a priest in uh, a Christian uh, mystical, uh, sec, um, what is it called? Order. Order. Yeah. Yeah. So you did that for 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah. Oh, 13 years uh, being a priest uh, and then having kids and being, so being a mom, being a priest, being an activist, peace activist, all at the same time. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then things needed to change. And so that was after 13 years there, 
uh, in service, then you kind of made this big switch that was like, instead of chasing after the extraordinary, you decided to embrace the ordinary life, mm -hmm. slow down, find out the true meaning of rest. Yeah. Um, you know, become the mom that you felt that you needed to be for your children. Mm -hmm. Huge, <laughs> huge shift. So eventually you moved back to Wisconsin where you live now with your husband and your kids and your homesteading, which is really cool. And I hope we learn a bit more about that. Um, and you went back to your profession as a, an occupational therapist and health coach and, and so on and so on. You did a lot of, you've done a lot of, you know, green, um, green team work, doing a lot of sustainability work within the organization and in the community. And that's been growing and growing which leads you to where you're at now, which is really focusing on climate action coaching. <laughs> well, that's the very short story. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting a few years ago. So when I left the order, I was a priest for 10 years and had been in the order for 13 years. And when I, um, I think, you know, having grown up in, I grew up in Illinois, um, and then eventually came to Wisconsin. My, my, one of my sisters went to Marquette and that was sort of my transition to Wisconsin after having lived abroad, but it was that abroad experience where my whole world just like flipped, you know, it was like, wow, this world is so much bigger than the community I grew up in. And the community I grew up in was, was wonderful. I mean, there were people who were wonderful, the, um, but it, it, it felt like I, I just, when I got out of there and saw what was around me and saw the diversity and saw, my gosh, there's, you know, people are from all these different backgrounds and, and look all these different ways and dress all these different ways and eat all of these different foods. But there's this current that runs through all of us that's so similar. And, you know, I'd have conversations with people where we were barely communicating in the same language, but on a heart level, we were definitely speaking the same language. And it just made me really curious for like, what is that common thread? Um, and then during my time there, I, I had taken an ecology class and really kind of started to realize, you know, oh, there's this interesting relationship between human beings and the natural world around us. And like, this is a, you know, and, moss and lichens and bryophytes and things that tend to 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 grow in these industrial areas and cleanse our air and like they're doing these things that help us and it just sort of like turned a, a light bulb you know like a little light bulb went on and then um I don't know how this happened I got invited well somebody I was I was dating at the time um ended up doing a, a waste analysis for Reuters news agency. And um, I said, I, I wanna do it with you. Let's do that, I can help you. And we did this waste analysis and we were like collecting a week's worth of trash in the parking garage of Reuters news agency in Brussels. And it, I mean, just like over the course of the week, seeing the amount of trash that a business accumulates and then you know, we were separating it and weighing it and a bigger, a huge light bulb went on then because I'm looking at it and I'm thinking this is one parking garage for one company, one branch of one company. And my mind just started calculating all of the trash in all of the entire planet, in all of the businesses, and then in our homes. And it couldn't unsee that, you know, it just like seared in my heart. So, um, you know, I eventually, I moved back from the, from Europe and came back to the States and occupational therapy has been this interesting thing because it's this undercurrent, like I've been doing it all the way along and all of these other things have happened, you know, but occupational therapy has been my constant and I'm, you know, in my most recent iteration of, of life and what I'm doing. I'm like, wow, my being an OT like really informs a lot of like a lot of what I've done over the years. So I can come back to that. But 
um, when I came back from Europe, I decided to, I really wanted to engage in my professional life, but I wasn't done wandering. Like I, I came back and I immediately found an opportunity to go to South America and um, met someone who was planning to go on a bike tour down there. And I'm thinking about the trash issues in Europe and all around the world. And he and I were talking about trash issues in Argentina. And I said, you know, this is um, like, this is a really good opportunity. You're going on a bike for, you know, a long stretch of time. Why not dovetail that with spreading a message about the environment? I mean, you've got a captive audience. You look like you've landed from outer space in the clothes that you're wearing. So why not use that? platform and do something with it. And so we started creating a nonprofit organization called the Argentina Bike Project. And pretty soon I'm like, he's like, well, why don't you bike too? So I'm, like, I'm just a recreational cyclist, but that sounds like a cool adventure. And if you really think I can do this, then heck yeah. You know, and I, I, I like as an OT, I've helped people recover from strokes and spinal cord injuries and, you know, really severe, severe life altering injuries. And I'm like, okay, I've got all my body intact. You know, I'm, I'm fairly fit as it is. I can just put myself on a training program and, and do this and be a part of spreading this message. So going to, you know, like the process of training and getting up every day like every morning at 5.30, I'm on my rollers in my basement, holding on to like the washing machine and dryer. And, you know, and just like, it, it was just this, this discipline, but it, it gave me a way to channel like that concern for the trash, you know, and the realization that this was so pervasive around the planet, but but now I had a way to focus it. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to go spread this message. And so even when the training got hard, because it, it's hard, you know, it's like every, every day, you know, I had to put in so many miles a week and I rode like 4,300 miles in total from sea level to 16,055 feet, you know, and like, that's no small, that's no small thing. And so there's lots of opportunities to just like want to quit, but I couldn't unsee the trash problem. And so I just kept, I'm like, okay, this is, I'm just going to keep doing this because this message is so important. When I got to Argentina, that was a whole other like awakening on so many levels because I realized like this world that I had grown up in is not the same world that most, that a lot of people around the planet grow up in. And I really understood my my privilege. And I also understood that with that privilege comes responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so part of that responsibility in on my trip in Argentina was just to say like, hey, this stuff that you see, we have, you know, the, com the stuff that the commercials are selling to you and the lifestyle that it's, it's selling to you and the smiles on people's faces and the laughter, like, it's kind of a crack. Like it, it doesn't, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. There's as many problems there as there are anywhere else. And there's things that you have already that you would have to sacrifice to have that. Yeah. And I can tell you from my own lived experience and from what I see around me, like it's not worth it. You know, all of the pining after and wanting and working like your ass off to have all this stuff and to sacrifice connection, to sacrifice relationships, to sacrifice pleasure and fun and, you know, and downtime and slow time, mm. um, you know, and it, so, you know, we talked with people in little remote villages and, you know, big cities and we slept in animal like little animal refuges we we slept in garages with generators we slept inside police stations and so we're like we're talking with people like from every walk of of life um 
you know, but I had this one like poignant memory of going by this little tiny creek with a boat in the creek. I don't even know how they got the boat in the creek. It must have been flooded at one point in yeah. time. I had a lot more water flowing through it. And a, a family was living in the side of this little boat. And there was a little boy with, you know, just he had like a, I don't know, it was like a Chicago Bulls t-shirt on or something. And then there's like the blue light of the TV flickering. And I, it just, it was just such a like juxtaposition of, it was so bizarre, yeah. you know, I'm like, what are you seeing on that TV? And it's so different from what your life is like. And it's, it's, you know, and, and, and then I, I stayed um, at one point, I was, I was struggling a little bit through this stretch of mountain passes and just needed a rest day. And there was a couple that was driving through and they're like, Hey, there's this mining camp. We can just like, they'll house you for the night. And then the guy you're riding with can like bike up to meet you, mm. give you a day of rest, and then you can go on from there. So I took the opportunity, but you know, so I'm staying in this mining camp and I think these two people were environmentalists and studying water and I was talking with them and I'm realizing like, I'm like, oh, the mining camp that's here in the middle of the mountain, that they're raking away the side of the mountain. Like, I think they were, no, I think they were actually putting in a pipeline, Okay. Okay. you know? And so I, I just like, I'm like, oh, like the animals that pass through that people depend on for the livelihood and they depend on for their food source is being disrupted because of this pipe, this pipeline that's going through right here. And, you know, and it's these big caterpillar tractors. And my father was an engineer for caterpillar and it was caterpillar tractors that were raking aside. And I'm like, how do they even get these tractors in here? Like they have to like airdrop them, you know, they're, they're, it was just insane. And at the time it didn't, on a, a, like a my, mental level, I didn't quite compute. Yeah. All that I was seeing, I just, something felt weird. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is strange. And then I, when I eventually like came back from Argentina, this was before I went into the order. I was like, oh my God, how do I do normal life again? Like how <laughs> I live in the, like I came back to the Midwest. I came to Wisconsin because my sister was here. I, I was going to work, you know, I came back to work as an OT and I'm like, I don't even know how to live anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and I just had to like put one foot in front of the other. And it was really a deep spiritual, like, I've got to find some peace. I've got to find a way to make sense of the world I'm living in. I've got to understand like, why the heck am I here? And what am I supposed to be doing in life? Because the way I see it, like things feel incredibly unfair. We're destroying the planet. There's trash everywhere. I mean, the trash that I saw on the trip was like, mm -hmm. we have, we have a system of putting our trash away. And when we throw dirt over it and then we grow grass on top of it and we can just mentally like mm -hmm. tell ourselves like, oh, it doesn't exist. I don't produce so much trash. They, they don't have the capacity to do that. in these places I bike through and so it's filling waterways and choking waterways. It's on the periphery of campgrounds. It's, it's like, you know, and, and, and many of the people there, like their mind is like, well, we can just throw it here because the pristine landscape beyond it goes on into infinity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and then you're biking along and you're like, oh no, that's not infinity. There's <laughs> another town just down the road and they're doing the same darn thing that you're doing. Yeah, exactly. There is no away. <laughs> Right. So it's like all those things. So then I, I discovered the Christian mystical order. I actually discovered it because I was facilitating these meditations through um, the urban ecology center in Milwaukee and um, Ken Leinbach, the guy that started, it's a, it's a huge thing. It's super cool now, but at the time it was like a little trailer park in the middle of a park. And he's like, or a trailer. He said, if you want to start these spiritual ecology meditations, that's fine. Like, sounds great. You know? So I just put the word out and I'm like, I, I got to do something to create some peace around this mm -hmm. issue. So I started gathering people and just, we were just like appreciating our, 
our likeness, you know, for all of our outer differences, we were appreciating our likeness and appreciating the green spaces around us and that we were actually like a part of these spaces. And um, in that process of, of facilitating those meditations, um, I also on the side of it was also exposed to the activism realm and would attend meetings for environmental activists. And I, I just was like, there's so much to do. You know, there's so many things, so, so much to heal, so much to fix. And I, and I had pursued a career path in, in health and healing, yeah. you know, and here I am over here getting into the activism realm because of what I had seen and experienced already. And I'm like, there's so much fighting and like, I'm right, you're wrong. This is the right way. No, that's the right way. This is the better way. And I'm like, there's no peace in this environment. Mm. And it just like, everything was sort of like clicking and computing. And I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna do this work, if I'm gonna like even exist on the planet through a normal lifespan, I first have to find some peace. Yep. And so I, um, somebody who came to one of my meditations in the park said, you should go check out this order. You know, she, actually she didn't even say order. She said, you should go check these classes out. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. You know, I was up for anything that was gonna help me. Yeah. And I went and it wasn't anything that I heard. It was how I felt. Mm -hmm. Like I was going for, I need peace. I need to yeah. feel peace. I need to know that there is a way to um, access peace within myself. I needed to anchor yeah. and ground. And um, that was, yeah, I, I found it there. And I just kept coming back for more. I kept coming back for more meditations. And I had tried like dabbled in some, some other other things, but I had grown up Catholic. And for me, you know, there was, a, there was, I hadn't experienced all of the negatives that, you know, are commonly kind of known. And some people feel about Catholicism there were, but I also knew that it wasn't like, wasn't fully doing it for me. Yeah. Um, and, but there was something comforting about Jesus and, and Mary, you know, being on the altar. And I felt I felt like all of a sudden I was getting to know these beings in a way that I had always longed to know them or at various certain moments felt them like when I received my very first first communion you know there was like this experience that I had and uncertain retreats I had done and so when I came into the order I was like oh that feels good like that feels safe that feels comfortable like I my something inside of me is being soothed and giving me permission to drop out of all the worries and the fears about what's happening on this planet and just allowing me to 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 not out myself like yeah. you know I felt like I was really at this point of like I don't know if there's a lot worth living for you know my life is great I've got a family I've got siblings I was the oldest of five kids you know we were a very well-respected family in our community my parents are wonderful like there wasn't anything I could pin it on to say that's why I feel so shitty yeah. <laughs> it wasn't about any of that and I tried to make it be about about that and it really was like this um and it was really a process of when I left the order I had gotten in one of my meditations to write to like write my story and I like took me a couple of years to start writing because I didn't know what I was I'm like I don't even know what to say and once I started I got I hired a coach um Jennifer she's a um purposeful memoir coach and she's also an environmental writer and Say she, her name again because it, it got it, it got just oh, a little bit of Jennifer Brody, B-R-O-W-D-Y. Yeah, for listeners who want to go check her out. Yeah, yeah, she's lovely. And she really helped me anchor in my own life story. And just starting from like 1970, you know, around the time of my birth and like what was happening on the planet then and kind of going through the course of my life. And I, 
it was in that process that I really started to see the thread of mm. what was happening with our environment and um, just kind of discovered that thread through my whole life and realized like, oh, that's why I went into the order. Like I needed this piece. And then when I came out, um, yeah, it was, yeah, I kind of lost my thought there, but. <laughs> well, it, it reminds me of the, when we, uh, when we were preparing together uh, in our last conversation, you know, we had kind of said it, it looks like when we think about your life story and the different, I mean, you've done so much, you know, in such a short time. Um, and it seems like you have had those, these moments where it's like the masculine, sort of the ma more masculine approach is like pushing on you. Um, I mean, some, to, to a degree, I mean, the masculine approach is great for certain aspects of the journey. Um, but it's like, you would get kind of inundated with that approach too much. So, and then you'd need to find like the balance, the, you know, the other side, the more regenerative, restful, intuitive, creative, um, that, that side. And when, you know, two times you use the word anchor and it makes me think of that feminine side that needs that that needs that rest, that anchoring, that care, the nourishment, you know, the thing that doesn't always know what the plan is and doesn't always know exactly what we're going to do about the 50 issues. And then that's not ready to be, you know, like outrightly competitive about things that's looking more to be collaborative and peaceful about things. I mean, it's not to, um, again, you know, it's not to say that one is better than the other. Sometimes you need to be competitive and sometimes you need to be um, aware of all of the high complexity of the issues in a, you know, like highly logical um, mm -hmm. rational way but it's like when it, it it you know it struck me in your story it's like every time that you would start to get sort of overwhelmed by the uh, analytical side then you'd be like it's almost like you reached a threshold that was like I need okay, now I need to I need to ground in into my piece and I think it's really inspiring how you were always able to push through the moment, push through, that sounds ter terribly masculine given the, given the context of the conversation, <laughs> but I mean, hold to hold tight or to continue to show up so that you would find that magical moment, would, which would, you know, help you to get to that restful, you know, the, help you to re-anchor in. So you had like these key moments where it's like you came back from Argentina and then, you know, you, you, you were kind of getting into the masculine side, the, a little too far all the analysis of things and in the activism world feeling that you know the more masculine approach of things and mm -hmm. uh, and then you you were you know you kept showing up and saying okay i'm i'm determined i'm committed to myself to find this piece and that is that i mean that side of it is really feminine like to keep showing up and saying i'm committed to a holistic approach i'm committed to meeting the full scope of the needs and not turning off this right side, you know, the more feminine side that's like uh, of the brain that's like, you know, kind of tuned into the whole and is not gonna give up. It's not gonna separate it out into fragments um, and only serve the one fragment. It's going to insist on wholeness. So, you know, you started doing the, um, the um, sustainability meditations and, or the, what did you call them? Not sustainability. Spiritual ecology. Spiritual ecology meditation. Yeah. And then that led you down this path that allowed you to, understand more about what was regenerative acti activism like mm -hmm. how could you be engaged through like a peaceful you know like a, 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 how could you be in, of service and how could you do these things from a peaceful point of view not cut off from the more masculine side of things but in the fullness of both and so it, it feels like because that was going to be one of my main questions for you like what was your and then I wonder if you could say whether it was conscious at any point in the process or if it was kind of more like in hindsight, you recognized like, oh yeah, that's when I started to balance things out. Or if there was kind of a moment when you thought, like when you kind of had this thought like, okay, I need to tune into the more feminine side. It was never that conscious, like I have to tune into the feminine side or I'm overdoing the masculine side. It was more of a like internally feeling yanked. <laughs> yanked you, toward, the, toward the more masculine side? Um, no, towards the more feminine. The, okay, that's cool. Uh -huh. I, I mean, for, for as long as I've 
you know, well, I think one of my strengths is endurance, mm -hmm. which can look, I think, outwardly, overly masculine at times. Cause I can, I can go like, I can, yeah. you know, I'm not going to be the fastest, but I can be the longest, you know, I can, I, you know, when it was ever since I was little, like I would sign up for like the swimathon and they're like, oh yeah, she'll do 10, <laughs> 10 laps. And I did a hundred, you know, it was like, yeah. oh my God, she doesn't stop. So I think that's just been a, a gift I've been blessed with um, yeah. and have used to my advantage over the years, but sometimes it gets me into trouble because I'm like, oh, wait, I should, I, I need to stop. Mm -hmm. And I think cultivating my connection with my own heart space has allowed me to tune in faster, you know, yep. to, to feel when, oh, I'm, go I'm going off, <laughs> yep. you know? And so, um, and even, even in, I mean, I, I really accredit my years in the order and my working with teachers. I mean, there was towards the end, we, we left because there was some just changes and there were some power issues and, and just things that felt like at this particular juncture, like I just need to step out of that arena and focus on my family. Um, that that step away, I think really allowed me to embrace um, something and it was just like, so in the order there was, I worked with teachers. I, sometimes we would sit in meditate, like we would sit in meditation and I would actually go through a process of going inside of myself to like hear what's, what's the right thing for me to do in this situation. And the work with my teacher was really about like really fine tuning my listening and, and knowing like what's, what's in the way, why am I not hearing this clearly? And the role of the teacher was sort of like to help me get out of my way. I think sometimes in certain circumstances, I'm, I'm like, really? I think that was a little biased toward like whatever <laughs> your agenda might've been. But many of the times there really was, um, I could feel it in me. I could feel you know, that place in me that was just like, yep, yeah, this, this is right. And I would step out on certain things where I'm like, oh, this is easy. It's easy to step out on this because it's, it's like in my flow, it's flowing with the energy that is a current in me that wants to move. Yeah. And when I left the order and I didn't, I wasn't working with the teacher, um, it became a really organic thing. And I was just like, this is wild. Like things would show up. I think I was sharing with you the other day. It was, you know, we were in moments where we're living on an Island and school starts on Monday and we're like on Friday, Thursday, Friday, like, yeah, I think we need to move to Bellingham. Like we need to do that. And school starts Monday. I think it was Thursday. We're like, okay, we got to go get a register tomorrow because school starts next week. We have to find a place to live. And things would just like, yeah. you know, things would align and mm -hmm. people would help. And I mean, I really realized how much help is available when yeah. we know which direction we need to go in. Yeah. And when we really tune in, it's like the doors open and things happen and it happens so fast. And yeah. so I really, in that process, came to trust just the organic flow of timing and mm -hmm. rightness of timing. and that we don't have to force things that they will or organically unfold if we allow it. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm come by eventually like life goes on, we decide to come to Wisconsin to have a farm. And, and I mean, there was so many, like the whole process, the whole way through was this organic, like, okay, now this is the right thing. Now this is the right thing. And I could just feel it and step out on it. And it doesn't mean that it wasn't hard. It doesn't mean that I didn't have like other ideas in mind yeah. or emotional reactions to the whole process of change. I mean, yeah, no, but, but that trusting in the flow and then seeing what opened up on the other side of it. Yeah. Um, 
that has really reinforced in me the value of 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 the feminine, of the opening, the expansiveness, the um, and the ability to trust that. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's a strong testimony, really strong, beautiful testimony to when you are working. You know, it's almost like when the feminine part and the masculine part are really like um, I'm gonna say it this way. It's, it's come it comes to me this way, which is kind of funny. It's not a normal way that I would uh, express this, but when they love each other, you know, on the inside mm-hmm. of yourself, and they both value so much value and appreciate the contributions of the other, and so it's like when the analytical mind listens to the intuitive mind, and the intuitive mind is like really search she gets to serve her place like serve her purpose Uh and then the analytical mind you know is like happy to use his i'm saying her and his just you know for the sake of the discussion but is happy to use his um skills and resources to like further like they're, they're both in agreement about like what is the way forward like we follow the intuitive path yeah based on some analysis but also based on this intuitive side. And then we find this way forward using the, the best of both. And sometimes one leads and sometimes the other leads and sometimes they, you know, they go together, but it's a true relationship inside of ourselves, okay. these two. And something you said that's so important, I think, is the, you know, you developed, you really cultivated this capacity for listening to the intuition. Because I know in working with many people, gender um, gender irrelevant, like any gender, uh, you know, there are so many people who are just stuck in the masculine side and they don't know how to get in touch with the intuition. Like it's been so downplayed as, um, as a valid way of, you know, finding answers. And then of course, there are some other people who are only li- listening to the intuition. Uh, they're stuck too far in the feminine side and they're, they've just deactiv- deactivated or culture has deactivated or, you know, their particular, life circumstances have kind of deactivated the masculine side. And so they're jumping from thing to thing, to thing, to thing. Um, and feeling, you know, not anchored in another way because you can be like too much in the feminine and not be anchored um, in let's say reality, or I don't know, <laughs> you know, in yeah. cause and cause and effect kind of thing. Um, cause and effect. And then like you know, dealing with the real, real world consequences of, of following the, following the intuition. Um, and, you know, like if your intuition isn't surrounded by, or like I said, in partnership with that more uh, analytical side, then, um, then it's like, it keeps making deals within itself, but it's a fragment of yourself, you know, it's one half of yourself and it's like making right. deals within itself. And you can get the feeling sometimes, and I'm sure you've seen it with, you know, the clients that you work with and, may, and probably experienced it sometimes yourself as have I, um, where it's like, yeah, my, one of my sides, you know, the masculine or the feminine are like just surrounding itself with more of the same. And so I was like making Mm -hmm. deals within this sort of imagined bubble of reality, um, making deals with reality in, in this bubble of reality. And it, every time you just get a little bit further away from the balance and yeah, I mean, in your case, you said you really got the, the, you felt yanked, you know, you felt really, you know, almost physically pulled back. I mean, that's the feeling I got. Like, yeah. it was like, don't, you know, don't go too far in that direction. You got to yeah. come back this way. Yeah. And I think the value of having mentors or coaches or guides or whoever, you know, whoever it is you, you trust that can be like, you know, I've had people, so we left in 2000. 13, um, you know, I definitely had like met with some, some people counseling therapy just to like reground in just coming out of the order. It's like living, we lived in the world, but, but it was essentially like living a monastic life of sorts. And so then reacclimating to the, the world was, um, far more challenging than one might imagine and you know it's like you have all this internal dialogue going on all of this like how you've existed for 13 years and it is so unlike how everything is happening in the world around you and yet everything in the world around you is normal to everyone else and you're like wow 
how, mm-hmm. how do I do this? Mm-hmm. So I, I worked with one woman who had, um, she was a, yo- a yogi and um, had really delved deeply into the spiritual arenas and spiritual studies and um, was kind of used to walking in both worlds and really helped me a lot just figure out how to, how to be again. Mm-hmm. When we moved from Bellingham back to Wisconsin to have to, cause we wanted to have a farm. Um, I knew, I knew I had things that I personally wanted to accomplish. And I, um, at the time there was a woman going through coach training and, um, a dear friend of mine was going through coach training and she also knew of some other women who were going through the training and said, this woman needs some hours to, for training. Would you be interested in just like accessing her services? And, um, I think her name was Laura Nelson. I want to give her name credit because, and it was like, it wasn't, there was nothing rocket science that she said or did. It was that she held space. And she gave me an opportunity to hear myself. And then she gave me a chance to be accountable to myself. And so for like every week for a series, of so we moved here back to Wisconsin in the summer of 2016. And we had many hoops to jump through and I had a job to find. And, you know, we were like bouncing around. We lived in like five or six different temporary places until we rented an apartment and and then it took us a year before we actually found our farm and I just knew I'm like I got to keep my eye on like where are we going because there's so much going on in this interim there's kids in schools and different schools and my husband ended up getting an opportunity Um, he won a scholarship and had an opportunity to go to Sicily for three months to study farming cooking and farming and and I was like, yep, do that. Cause that fits with what we're trying to do. And so I think working with a coach and getting the plan out of me, externalizing it, writing it down was so valuable because I'm like, yep, this fits. Nope. That doesn't fit. Yep. This fits. Nope. That doesn't fit. And so I, I didn't get sucked into the mire and into all the little details and overwhelmed by them. It could kind of ride the surface of them and move that plan forward, which feels to me like the masculine energy. It's just like, it moves. It needs to know what are the steps to take and how to move on them. But the, the feminine part, like in that process of working with a coach, I just got to dump out like, okay, here's all the stuff that's here. Here's all the the things that I am worried about. Here's what's in my heart. And, um, you know, it's, it's like, I could hear both sides of myself and marry them together to keep moving forward. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and a lot of times when people think of coaching, they think of the more masculine side of things like, okay, you know, you talk about what your goals are and you talk about what the plan is and how you, and that is part of it. And like, even in your coaching, that is part of it. Climate action plan. We're going to talk about it. Like that's a super important part. I mean, and you know that from being an OT, an occupational therapist, I know that also from being a therapist, from being a coach, like you, the plan is very important. And Mm -hmm. so is the space, the space to discover, the space to explore, the space to say your intuitions out loud, express them somehow in a shared, in a shared, you know, shared space where somebody is as curious and as interested in what your intuition is showing, what it wants to say. Um, as you are, or sometimes even more, which encourages uh-huh. you to take them seriously. Well, I think they, a coach, someone just, and it could be, you know, if you had a trusted friend, a trusted confidant that really yeah. was there for you. But I think in our world where I, I, I've had plenty of friends that have helped me so much. And I have a dear friend that I um, actually served with in the order that we, we talk with regularly. And she's, just such a help to me, but having a a coach really like helps me activate a plan. It's like, I've got a big goal and I got to break it down into lots of parts. And I've also got a life to keep living. I've got kids to keep 
you know, being showing up for, I have a spouse to show up for, I have a home that has, you know, laundry to do and, you know, just all the stuff of life. So when there's something, um, you know, in, in my current activism work, you know, we moved back, I'm working as a therapist and then the elections happened in 2016 and like, I'm like, oh my God, like what, there's this thing that's so important to me and yet the world around me looks so, I mean, it looks so different from the world I came from in Bellingham and, and then I'm here in Wisconsin and it's a completely split divided state. And I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't know what conversations to have. I didn't know who to talk to at work. I didn't know. Um, and around that time, shortly after somebody at work, we'd been talking about environmental stuff and he came to my office one day and he's like, would you like to help me start a green team? I was like, yes, <laughs> I totally would love to help you start a green team. I'm like, can we, like, do we have permission? You know, cause I'm wearing the hat of manager of a team of 70 therapists. And I love that role, but my dog is coming through. Oh, no, so we have a special like, guest. <laughs> I, I was just like, so it just like something lit up in me because I could do something. I could take all the concern and the angst and the fear and the worry and that had been heightened by the elections and and just channel that and start you know putting one and so that was like an organic thing it just I, I think in my heart my dry my desire was there for that but I didn't know like I didn't know how to orchestrate that I didn't even know that that was something I wanted yeah but what happened I'm like hell yeah I'm doing that like yes yes yeah. And then the team kind of fell apart. And so my passion for the topic, my, for the cause, like, they were like, would you like to take over leading this team? And I'm like, yeah. And then I like, I didn't have a team. So I had to figure out how to keep it moving forward. And I think that, you know, like I want a better earth. Yeah. You know, I want a better planet. I know I want that. Like, yeah. and so I'm going to move towards that. And, yeah. and yet then I have to like be receptive to what's coming to me. What are the opportunities coming to me? How can I sit back inside of me and show up to this work in the way that I am uniquely prepared to? And yeah. all I really had to lead with was the trash that I've seen, you know, the experiences that I had in Argentina. Um, and I'm like, and I know how, I know how, how to help people through processes of change in hard times. I mean, that's been my career as an occupational therapist. I know how yeah. to break big things down into smaller parts. Yeah. And I know how to look at like, what makes a meaningful life yeah. given whatever handicap you might suffer from. Cause we've all got them. Yeah. Right. You know, right. some are visible, some are not, but we've all got them. Yeah. And how do we, you know, and then we throw the climate crisis on top of it. I mean, that like throws us all for a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be a handicap, but it could also be an opportunity for us to yeah. like show up in ways that we didn't, we, we just, didn't even occur to us before. Yeah, because uh, we don't all respond the same way. I mean, what I feel as eco anxiety or something could be very different than from what how the next person experiences it. And it's there's a lot of really like valuable information in that. Like there would be so many people who saw the trash in the, you know, in the garage in uh, Brussels and would be like, might be like that makes me I don't know you know for you it was like that's kind of scary I guess it's scary because it made you think about everything and somebody else might be like that makes me angry or somebody else might be like that makes me ashamed of you know the planet and who we humans and so on and so forth and even that like even our negative responses or I mean the the sort of negative emotions or I don't, I don't like to use the word negative but you know the more the, the heavier emotions that we uh -huh. feel 
uh, even point us in different directions. Like it wouldn't be everybody's way to then, you know, go cycle in Argentina and, <laughs> you know, raise awareness and talk to, to people that way. It might be something totally different. And that's like for everybody to pay attention to. And I think, again, I think your story is so interesting because you, you have cultivated the capacity to pay attention and to stay I'm going to use the word patient. You can tell me if it's accurate, <laughs> but I mean, from the outside, it's like, wow, you stayed really patient during those times where, you know, maybe you didn't have a total clear thing and you just knew that it was, like you said, you were just like, okay, during that time after you moved back to Wisconsin and you're like, okay, we just, I'm, you know, I'm just here and I'm doing my work and, you know, your work as an occupational therapist and a manager wasn't about saving the planet. I mean, it's about the healing journey of your clients and, you know, supporting the therapists in supporting other people's healing journey. And that's meaningful in its own way, but it wasn't like you were sitting there going, okay, what I'm doing right now isn't, you know, fully co um, corresponding to the big thing. And I, what is the, what am I doing about the trash? And it was like, okay, this is like, this is my life right now. This is what I'm doing right now. But that led you to like that groundedness or that anchor anchoredness, like allowed you to be present and available to hear the thing that came up for you, which was like the green team, you know? <laughs> so, well, it's um, interesting because yeah, when I, when I was in, before we, so we were in Bellingham in, in Washington and we loved it there. I mean, I, 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 I loved it. I loved a friend, my, our friends. I loved, I mean, they didn't know the full extent, but most people didn't know what life we were coming from that we'd been in an order for many years and basically yeah. living a monastic life and then trying to do that with two kids. But, um, I felt like we got to just be normal human beings mm -hmm. and I was close to family. The mountains were literally right out our back door. We lived on a, a farm property of 150 acres at the foot of the Cascade Mountains and you know that the Puget Sound was not very far away and I drove around for home care I drove all over and mm -hmm. I mean I was going to islands to do therapy I drove to into the foothills I it was just yeah breathtaking and gorgeous and so fulfilling on many levels but my husband got into cooking and farming and really wanted to have a farm. And I thought, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in these next several years, but I just felt like I want my kids to have this experience of, of having a farm and learning how to grow their food. And, and it seemed that like being in the home space together and creating stuff and growing stuff and cooking and was just like fit for us. Mm -hmm. It felt very soothing um, for us to find our stride in that. Yeah. Um, and we, and we were looking for like, what are rituals and what's, mm. cause we kind of came out of a life that was filled with lots of ritual yeah. and how, what are those daily rituals that we have that bind us together as a family? And it became cooking and eating and sitting around the table and just kind of slowing our pace with each other. And I um I, I think it, through that time too, our marriage was an arranged marriage in the order. <laughs> so so coming out of the order and leaving that life, I'm like, do we keep do we keep going? Yeah. You know, why are we together? And is it just for our kids or what's what's yeah. I felt like I needed to know the bigger purpose and this farming thing seem to be and I, I've always had a pet like a desire to have a, a, a retreat space like hold a retreat space for women mm. and so I was I, I on Valentine's Day one year I just I gifted him with a trip to Italy and I'm like you go figure out the cooking thing and I love to travel like it was bizarre that I would just do that because I, I you know I'm you know but I was like you have to go figure this out and yeah. I have to figure myself out and I have to figure out like, are we going to keep going together and keep creating life together? And if we are, what kind of life is that going to be? And so in that process, I did my own meditation work and this, like 
this whole thing, this life I'm living right now kind of showed up like it's a farm and it's not in Washington, it's in Wisconsin. <laughs> like, Are you sure? Huh, really? <laughs> like, but I love it here. It's amazing yeah. here. Yep. And and what I could feel in Wisconsin was like there's growth for you there. Yeah. Mm. There's spiritual growth for you there. It's it's your personal growth, your spiritual growth. You can't see what that growth is going to be yet, but that's your pathway to growth. And I could feel the reality of that in like, oh my God, like I so loved where I was, but it was, I was taking a lot. Like it was taking from the mountains and taking from the environment and taking from the visual splendor in, in, in ways I needed to, like I needed to drink that in. I was reaching this point where I'm like, it's, I need to give, like, it's got to come back out of me and it's not here. It's somewhere else where that needs to come out. And I didn't know what it was going to look like at all. Like I kind of had the farming piece in my mind, but I didn't know the other pieces. And so, you know, in my job, it was like, okay, I'm learning about leadership. Like I was learning a lot about like, I'm managing a team of 70 people and I'm like really learning my own stride. Um, I'd been in other leadership positions, but it was like, it was something was different. Mm -hmm. But even in that, I'm like, okay, still a lot of like day-to-day tasky stuff, but I just stayed open and like let myself like that need to know just, I just like, okay, it's, it's gonna, I'll know when I know. Yeah. And then the invitation came for the green team. And I was like, oh, that's it. Yeah, yes. exactly. Like that's it. And yeah. then the door, like that has opened the door for so many other things that just keep like blowing my mind. Yeah. I'm like, oh, this, oh, this. And, and I'm like, you know, needing to really be discerning and pick and choose because I know whichever door I open, it's going to open up further in that yeah. direction. So, but I can trust that if I'm opening the right one, yeah. then I can also trust that the doors that open as a result of opening this one will also be the right ones. I love that you were, you use the word trust because that's what was coming to my mind when you were, you know, sharing this, this segment of the story is like the, I think this is one of the main signs that I can see in myself and in other people that I work with when the, when the two parts of the, you know, inner self, the, the masculine and feminine are balanced with each other. One of the easiest signs that I've seen to know that they're in balance with each other is trust. Trust even when things don't make total sense. Trust when you're waiting. Trust in your vision. Trust in the, the process. I mean, it sometimes I think people think of trust as like apathy and I don't mean it like that at all. It's not just like thinking, okay, well, there's nothing I can do to control whatever it's sometimes I I hear people use the word surrender, but then that can have like weird religious connotations or some that can have some, some connotations that people don't feel comfortable with. But I think of trust like this, this feeling of that you can trust your own system um, Mm -hmm. and that, it's, it's even like deeper than resilience because sometimes people talk about it as resilience, like, okay, I'm resilient and I wait till the, the thing is clear, but resilience has this kind of, you know, bracing for impact. I mean, for me, when I think about resilience, like bracing for impact, impact, and then I got to like get back, like I bounce back, but trust is really kind of this, again, you know, this anchored feeling, this rootedness. Um, I so, keep yeah. having this vision come to mind as you're saying that it's like you're, you're on a mountain path and there's like a, a narrow you know like like a, a deep cliff drop whatever and there's a narrow piece here and a narrow piece here and you've got to step over it and like just trust that that's going to hold you you're yeah. just gonna leave the ground here and step over to the ground here and it's going to be solid and hold you and you've got it you know like you you have to keep going yeah and I think that's so key right now like we don't have the time to, to slow up, to wait, to, I mean, there, there's a, there is a, we, we need to carve out the time to do that if we haven't, 
because it's vital. But then once we do that, we've, we've got to transition to get to the point where we can be in, in motion in purposeful motion. Yeah. And I think when we can do that, trusting like that internal, internal promptings and stepping out on those, then the steps that we take, like the things that are opening up now for me, I, one of the things I do in my course is like, look at your, look at your spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. And, and I do a lot of meditative and reflective work. There's a lot of hands-on stuff um, that's happening kind of in and between the sessions, but we all stand inside of a lot of concentric circles of, of influence. And we, if we know that, and we can be intentional about moving energy out into those spheres, we can have a lot of impact and it doesn't have to come from a lot of effort. Yeah. And you know, right now, like in Mark, in like trying to market my course, it feels like there's a lot of effort because I'm like doing the social media stuff and yeah. I'm trying to put myself out there in ways that I'm not really like haven't developed my muscle at that. So it feels mm -hmm. that feels effortful. Yeah. But there's other things that I'm doing where, you know, I'm, I'm really just my prayer is like, I just want to touch as many people as I can. I want to spread this message and, and be a catalyst for other yeah. people to be a catalyst within their own spheres of influence because if I can touch one person and then they touch all the people in their spheres like that's that's change and that gives me hope and I don't have to be the person touching all those people I can't be mm -hmm. I don't exist inside of their sphere they do mm -hmm. and and but standing in my own sphere I've, I've gotten involved in like health care like climate action and health and <laughs> opportunities are opening up for me that are like I'm like, did I just get this email? Did I yeah. really just get this invitation? Like, are you freaking kidding me? This is amazing. And and I didn't I didn't work for that. I didn't like it was not effortful for those doors to open. I just showed up as myself and I showed up using my voice, asserting what's important to me and vowing to myself to to just keep stepping out on that. If there's words to say, then I'm going to say them. Even if they feel awkward and hard, mm -hmm. I'm going to say them because they're there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm guided to take certain steps, I'm just going to raise my hand and say, I'll take those steps. Mm -hmm. I can do that. Like, I'm not going to take all these other ones that are for somebody else to take because mm -hmm. I don't know how to take those steps. But these I, I do, or at least I know how to take the first one. And so I'm going to do that. Yeah. And, yeah, and it comes out of abundance. And, and that's what I think is drastically different. I mean, when we talk about regenerative, regenerative act sorry, regenerative activism and, and agency, you know, it's this agency that's born from abundance and it's this activism that's born from a regenerate, like a regenerated self. So I think a lot of people are coming into the question, like, you know, with the hair on fire, like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? How can I fix this? And I get that because I've been with the hair on fire in the past <laughs> about, the, about this question and many questions, but, um, but it's like that, there's this first kind of step. Um, I mean, and it's kind of a re recurring step to make sure that you are coming from a place of inner abundance. But like for you, when you were living in the Pacific Northwest, you had this thing that was feeding your soul, feeding your body, and you weren't doing direct activism at that time. But it was like this t time to really, you know, fill the need so that you could be in this phase of your life that you're in now where the, um, the invitations come to lead the green team. It comes from the community to, uh, um, you know, do work in leadership and clim climate and healthcare questions. And these big things that are showing up for you that you can say yes to now because you can, you, you know, you, you are from this coming from this place of abundance and you can, it's abundance of your own self. Like, again, it kind of comes back to the trust thing. It's like, you know, it's you as Kelly engaging, not you as Kelly trying to do what everybody could do. Maybe you should do that. Maybe yeah. you, there's all of these opportunities. It's, it's like this directed path that, you know, what, kind of what I'm talking about, like the analytical is there, but it's not overpowering the intuition. And it's all kind of driven by this abundance that you, that yes. you cultivated by taking that time. Because a lot of the women that I've worked with on these questions, I mean, again, gender kind of doesn't really matter here, but um, 
you know, a lot of people are kind of coming from this place of lack and disconnection between these parts of themselves. And they're trying to force themselves over that. Um, yeah. You mentioned like the, the kind of the deep drop and then kind of forcing themselves over the thing without really trusting them not having a sense of trust within themselves and not having a sense of trust where they're going to land and that it's going to be okay where they land. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's both on the inside and the outside. And it's to, to be cultivated. Like that abundance is to be cultivated inside, inside oneself and outside, like in the relationships, like you're talking about the concentric circles. And if somebody doesn't take the time to, like you said, you, you left the, the, the spiritual order because things were tricky and there was a separation and there in the in the congregation and you know it wasn't the place where you were going to find that abundance for yourself at that time like the social abundance and the 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 feeling of you know this deep social trust that like okay I can do whatever I you know calls me the most and I'm in the right place for that mm -hmm. Sometimes it's taking these risks of changing your circles of influence and changing where you're at so that you can have that trust on the outside. And one thing mm -hmm. I find uh, is, you know, the toxic masculinity that, um, that, mm, you know, we kind of are surrounded by one way or another in capitalism, corporate America, corporate, the corporate world around and other reasons. Um, other contexts and it's like that can be really difficult to kind of fight because it can be internalized and it can fight against the inner feminine and like tell the inner feminine like you know shh, like your ideas are stupid or they're not worthwhile yeah. or um they you that energy that feminine energy is exists to serve me the toxic masculine and it can all kind of be a scary place to engage and so it's like so important to be working with that on the inside to be able to get to where you're, you know, you're at right now, which is able to say yes to these really great things that are coming up because you have that inner abundance and that inner trust and the inner balance. And you've done the hard work of making sure the circles around you are safe places to take action in. And, and you know, I mean, you wouldn't be able to do these steps that you're doing right now if you hadn't cultivated having you know a safe circle around you not to say it's 100 safe all the time because i mean you know the life yeah. is a complex place but well and it's realizing that like i'm safe in me yeah and so if i'm being prompted to say something or do something or step out in some way and like it, it could be rejected but if I don't, you know, it's like, I, ha I have to honor what's, what's moving in me, what's being stirred or prompted in me and, and just put it out there. And, and I, I do, and I, I, you know, there's like voices of like, why'd you do that? Why, why did you, you didn't need to say that. Yeah. Maybe that was too much. And I've learned that those aren't voices of truth you know, that that's like my monkey mind, just like yeah. doing its thing. And I'm, I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm, you know, I, I hear you. You've been talking to me my whole life. Yeah. And you can just sit right over there because yeah. I just said it and it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I just put it out there. So let's just see what happens. Yeah. And I, I marvel at the things that happen. And it allows me to just dare more, like to just be more courageous and putting more out and like, oh, what else is in there to come out? Because this is my own contribution to the problem in front of me. Yeah. And um, I was thinking as you were talking earlier, and I've had this vision come to mind many times, but it's like, you know, like, the sun, you know, we all are, we have a generative source of energy inside of us, you know, and if you do any meditative practice at all, you, you, you can feel that there's something there, you know, and it, and then the more you do that, the more it comes out, but it's like the sun isn't 
wielding around in the sky and going crazy and like trying to shine, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's just like, it just is, it just shines, just radiates light. And if you, you know, come into its presence, like you feel its warmth and you see its light and we all can do that. Like we all have capacity to do that, but I think we don't remember that about ourselves. And I think we live in a world right now, we live in a time where like the things that are happening are demanding of us to shine and the way we are uniquely designed and prepared to shine. And our only job is to see like, where am I not allowing myself to do that? Um, And so really the, the process of my course is, is, in the midst of this climate crisis is to help women figure out how do you shine best in this, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of your life and your, your kids or your family or your partnerships or your commitments, your job, like how do you shine best? Because that's gonna be, that, that's a, a source of energy that is needed for this movement. And it's gonna come from you and through you if you can see like, what are the barriers to that shining? Like what keeps you from shining? Yeah. And how do we remove those so that you can say yes to the things that are yours to say yes to? Yeah. Yeah, and I imagine you also are really like an active guide in, in this balancing of the masculine and feminine, like no, like noticing when the, uh, or, let's say giving space for the feminine to, arise and speak up and then, you know, uh, consciously using the masculine to provide the structure to make the vision come true and to, you know, to bring its own wisdom to the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, what I bring to this work with, you know, in, in the spaces that I'm in is I'm a space holder, you know, I can hold space and I can ask questions. I don't know the answers for, for each person. I mean, that's, those are answers that each person has to figure out for themselves, but I can ask the questions and I can, you know, tack on more questions to those to really get to the heart of, yeah. um, you know, to the heart of whatever it is. Makes me think of like the kind of self-development process or so, like personal development process that, I lead people through uh, in their own self-discovery. And it's like, I always find people can really burn out even in their own self-discovery because they're like, especially in the world I work in with high intelligence, it's like, you know, these minds that are all over the place and go here and there and learn the next thing and everything. It can be like so, so busy, especially on the analytical side. And it's like, there's a way to do this process where, um, you get more and more rooted, you get like more curious and more um, like more present and and more like in your own sort of rootedness as opposed to out there and all of that. It's not that that doesn't happen, but that becomes sort of this consequence of this this rootedness. And so I find it's like, when I think about your course, some, some people I can imagine might think that it's like an, you know, from point A to point B, yeah, like you get to point B by the end of the course and it's like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like some, some other version where you're like rooting and rooting and you get to all yeah. these points within like the, this deep, I mean, I talk about abundance. We've used kind of different words, anchoring, trust, you know, all of these things that have to do with the regenerative activism lifestyle, let's call it like that. But it's like, you're getting more and more deeply into yourself and that gets you yeah. more connected to the world, ironically. Like yeah. the more you're trying to connect to the world like this uh, with all your ideas, or I don't know, this kind of feeling, I gotta get my plan and I gotta, the less you're connected with yourself. And so the less you are able to be connected with the world. Like one of my main things that I'm working with people on is kind of deepening their intimacy with life in general. And in order okay. to do that, you have to deepen the intimacy with yourself. And then you can show up and actually listen to the world, like listen to the earth, listen to whatever is, you know, whatever is, is in your sphere of being 
and mm-hmm. have a real relationship with it as opposed to this preconceived thing that's like I must fix you therefore I don't even need to listen to you because I just need to tell you what you know this, this kind of thing um, and that can happen of course even in the activism yes yeah yeah it, it is um it's a lot of deep dives you know around different things and I think it's it's in those deep dives that you get permission to it's it's like you can see what's all the 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 surface extra stuff and fluff that you've tried to add on thinking you know you know it's like (laughs) I've done this several times where you know in, in our home in my girls bedrooms where they're like I want I want it to look different or look better and I discovered you know we're just you just like okay take everything out. Yeah. We're going to take everything out. We're going to clean it, get all the dust bunnies out, like clean the whole thing. And then we're only going to bring back in the things that you need and love. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And they've really grown to appreciate the, the simplicity of their space. Yeah. Um, and the process is just like so cathartic, but we don't really do that that much in our own lives. Like what what happens if we just like give ourselves permission to look through all of it and what can, what can we like like, clear out so that we can make room to do the things that we need to do and love to do and that serve us and that serve the world around us. And I really do believe that you know, when we, when we thrive fully, all parts of us, cause we are earth being. So as an earth being, exactly, when we thrive, our, our planet thrives, yeah. you know, that the two go hand in hand. And, um, I've, you know, I, I, I started off, I think my activism journey, just seeing firsthand, like, oh, this is a really fast ticket to suicide you know it could be um hopelessness disconnection like polarization um that's not the world I want to live in and so if I juice that by putting all my energy there I'm just re- I'm creating more of that and I don't that's not what I want so I'm you know I think the work that I yearn to do with women is to just help them figure out like, you know, you don't have to add more stuff on. You don't have to keep putting more stuff on your plate to fix, you know, you, you start with fixing it in you and it will naturally start fixing in those concentric circles around you because that's, that's energy. That's how energy moves. And, you know, I think for a lot of women, it's learning, (sighs) figuring out how they would uh, define thrive in a way that actually means thriving, you know, for Mm -hmm. them, what really, Mm -hmm. what is meaningful. I like the way you describe it with your daughter's rooms, because it it is that it's like taking everything out and then looking at the definition, like how have you thought that you're going to thrive? Because a lot of people, you know, think it's more money or um, perfect looks, or I don't know, whatever they, the perfect, having the perfect family or whatever perfect is um, and, you know, getting more stuff or, you know, like promotions at work or something. And maybe some of those things, you know, to a, to a degree are meaningful. Some aspects, you know, some, some aspect and some degree of those things are meaningful, but in the end, our world is changing a lot. And um, like you experience, once you see these things, you can't unsee them. Once you see the state of the world, once you see, the climate issues, once you see the, you know, social injustices and everything, you can't unsee it. And so mm-hmm. when you have a bigger vision, you have to redefine thriving. Like what is, when you mm-hmm. see the, the higher complexity of the world around you, you have to redefine thriving. And so I guess that's what you're doing with women through the course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and really like give yourself permission to create a vision that is like, what does thriving look like to you? Mm. And don't limit it in, in terms of what you think is possible. Like sometimes we limit the vision to fit our current, you know, mindset of what's possible. Go big. Yeah. And then 
and then we can work, you know, then we can come back to like, where are you now? And what's, what stands in your way of that? Yeah. Um, but again, it's, a uh, you know, we spend time on, on each of these things on really exploring, like, why are you doing this? And, and there's a lot of really powerful questions to get deep into that, you know, and then what is the vision for the, the world that you want to be a part of and live in and what feels like a thriving world for you? Yeah. Um, and there's so many different facets of, of climate, you know, yeah. it's, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's power issues, it's diversity issues, it's, um, it, I mean, everything exists within that. And so there's a lot of different ways to go about this work and all are needed. Yeah. Um, and I found permission to say no to things that I really like, there's certain things that are really important to me, but I've been able to say no to them because I'm like, I can't say yes to that and also say yes to this. And this is where my heart is called to be and work. So mm -hmm. I will, you know, but then I like send emails over to people when I get information from this that serves that, their purpose. Yeah. And I'm like, you should, have, you know, look at this. This is great for you. And yeah. they bring it to their group. And um, yeah, and I get to like, just show up for what is mine to do. Yeah, which is really beautiful. Okay, well, I suppose we have to get to the um, the more technical uh, questions about the course. The um, I'd like to ask you like a thousand other questions uh, about things, um, but we should close soon. So, um, so tell us just a little bit about the schedule of the course and how people can learn more about it and sign up and get yeah, in touch with so, you or get in touch um, with coaching uh, outside of the course. So it's the course itself is 12 weeks and it's every Saturday. I actually initially was going to do it on Wednesdays and I shifted it to Saturdays so that um, people from many time zones could participate. <laughs> um, um, and it was interesting because as soon as I made the shift, that's when the invitation came to take on this more leadership position within yeah. this with the other group. And I was like, wow, look at that. That's perfect. So um Saturdays um Saturday morning central standard time so for European time it's, it's in the afternoon um and it the way that it'll go it's so it's 12 weeks total but the for like for six six um every other week or six weeks will be more content heavy mm -hmm. and then the next week will be more coaching heavy okay so content and coaching. And so, say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. And so each week we'll cover a different theme. Um, and then there will be some reflective work to do in between and, and hands-on work. I think that within activism, it's just like getting active and using our bodies yeah. with our connection to the planet, with our connection to, you know, just creative, the creative side of us. Um, there's a lot of that in the course. That's great. Um, yeah, and it's so fun. I've I've done um, I've done this in a beta group, um, and I I'm working with a woman one on one now, and it's just so fun to see what comes out of it for the women that are participating um, and their own surprise. Yeah, you know, their own surprise with like, wow, I didn't realize how because um, I took some women who didn't even know if this was a real issue for them and they realized like oh my gosh this is like stealing so much of my life force I didn't even know it like I, I just wasn't giving myself time yeah. to be with it and then they also realized like and I wasn't doing that because I didn't know what to do about it yep and so and at the end they're like oh my gosh I there's a lot I can do and I, I don't have to go do it over here. I can do it in the role I'm already in, Yeah. which is, um, I really want to work with women to, to leverage, I mean, your professional life, your, you know, the things that you already are doing and you've spent a lifetime cultivating skills yeah. at, um, and just pivoting, you know, if you can see how to use that in service of, of a, a better planet, 
um, you know, I think most of us would. It, it just feels like a natural extension of who we are as earth beings. Like it's, it's a part of our natural evolution to want to be in service of our planet. Yeah, yeah I agree, obviously. <laughs> but that was a huge step for me as well, like realizing I can do this. I can do use what I already have and leverage it in the service of the planet. Because it wasn't obvious when I first started doing climate work. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna have to switch. And then I realized, no, I, I have a, you know, I have 20 years that I've invested in becoming a psychologist and in practicing and being a coach and you know, all of these things. And I can, I mean, you know, climate psychology exists <laughs> and it need it's needed, yeah. you know. I mean, yesterday I was on a tour with somebody. I'm, you know, I'm our green team leader at work and I was just touring a, a new facility, a rehab facility here in Milwaukee. And we did the tour. It's brand new. Like they're still finishing it out. And we we're kind of looking at, you know, partnerships with our work. And at the end, I looked at the woman who gave us the tour and I said, so what are your sustainability practices? I said, I'm a green team leader at work. And so this is something that we value. And I'm also a part of um, a group, Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. So I know there's a lot of healthcare professionals within our state that are really passionate about this. I said, you know, I said, it really can save a lot from your bottom line, you know, from, for budgetary reasons, it's important. And for hiring and retention, it's also important. So what are you guys doing about that? And, um, and it was just like, so easy. It yeah. took me two minutes to say, and she like stopped in her tracks and she's like, huh, I'm going to talk to my CEO about that. Okay. And I said, great. I said, I can send you some information. There's lots of help, lots of resources. I can help you take the first steps, you know, but it was, if, if I stepped out of my role to go do this work somewhere else, like that's important. There's, there's room for all of it. Yeah. But if I had stepped out of that, no one else was going to have that conversation about that. Yeah. And, right. and I don't know where that's going to go for them, but I'm definitely going to follow up. And, yeah. it, you know, and so that's like just honoring that that's a role I'm in. So I'm going to use it to, to try to make something better. Yeah. It almost reminds me of like a transferable skills analysis. Like I used to do in my early career days, you know, when I was doing vocational psychology and I would sit down with a client and say, okay, let's list out your skills. Let's list out your competencies. Let's list out your background and experiences. And then let's look and how do they transfer? You know, you can't do your same career anymore because of an injury or whatever, but they are usable skills. So, you know, what can we do with them? And it almost like feels like this climate, climate career coaching is you know, it's part of it. It feels yeah. like it's, almost its own thing, you know, where it's like, okay, let's sit down and look at what do you have? What do you bring to the table? And then let's turn that into, as you do, let's turn that into a climate action plan. Yeah. So how many spaces did you say are available for women to join? So uh, 20 total. Okay. Um, yeah, I was going to limit it more than that, but I've been working with someone. She said, you know, the, the conversation that happens with, yeah. with, more that everybody kind of feeds off of each other yeah. and so I'm like okay well let's just open it up for um yeah for 20 and and then within the course I'll have smaller pods that will just have accountability partners so that throughout they can be connected to each other and um, just hold each other accountable through the work that they're doing yeah, that's fantastic brilliant Okay, so people can go to kellygreencoaching.com to learn more. And yes. if anybody is also just like fascinated by your story and kind of wants to read more about your journey in your personal writings, they can go to uh, slowandsimpleliving.com. And that's very enjoyable reading. I highly recommend reading the Carbon Footprint post. <laughs> I liked them all, but that one was one of my favorites. Um, and I also want to share that... Uh, something that stood out to me in preparing for today was that the quote that um, has like been so inspirational for you is the same quote that was so inspirational for me all along on my path. And that's the one um, from William uh, H. Murray, you know, this, this classic one that we hear a lot, but it was, you know, so powerful, like until one is committed 
uh, the things don't show up, providence doesn't act, but once one is committed, uh, you know, all of the opportunities show up for us to live that vision. And I've held that quote, you know, in my mind for the last 20 years, like after I really decided to change my life, like I held that quote and was like, I know that it starts as a commitment to myself first, and mm -hmm. then that grows and that opens up all of these avenues to expand that commitment and live that commitment out and experience it. And it's not like every day is perfect and everything just completely flows and everything else, but there is a guiding line. And I've seen that in your story too, which I really appreciated. So any, I'll, I'll put that quote in the, um, in the, in the show notes uh, as okay. well, just, you know, so people can have a look at it. And then to close out, we're going to get a lovely meditation from you. you there's something that you've prepared for us. So I haven't heard it. I'm excited to listen as well. Um, yeah. So you can, I will give the floor to you and you can do the meditation and then we will be on our way. Okay. So um, I'm mindful that some of you might be listening from your car. So don't close your eyes if you're in your car. <laughs> um, for those who are sitting in a, you know, just sitting, listening, if you can close your eyes. And for those of you who can't do that, you can come back to this later or just kind of mentally go through the process. So just take a few deep breaths. And bring yourself into your heart. Feel your feet planted on the earth. Now visualize yourself in a garden, a beautiful garden filled with all different types of trees. Notice the various shades of green, the unique way each tree rises up to greet the sun and anchors down into the earth. And just keep noticing what kinds of trees do you see? kind of fruit are these trees bearing? Notice the way the fruits Release from the branches and drop to the earth. Notice how each tree bears a particular kind of fruit. And if it's an apple tree, it bears apples. Orange tree bears oranges. It doesn't try to bear anything different. Come back to yourself in that garden and feel your feet planted on the earth. 
And allow yourself to observe the roots that come from the bottom of your feet down into the earth that anchor you. Just observe the trunk. Come up your body as if it's a trunk and Notice the branches that branch out from you. What kind of tree are you? Now look out at your branches and observe what kind of fruit do you bear? And as you stand there, kind of rooted in yourself, rooted down into the earth, bearing fruit, allow yourself to be, to just scan that garden space around you and observe all ways that other trees are bearing fruit. according to their design, how they were made and allow yourself to just bear the fruit that you were prepared to bear. Notice how the, the fruits drop to the earth. And over time, organically penetrate into the earth. And then rise up and take on a life of their own. Acknowledge that within yourself that you are a life bearer, a life giver. That all life forms on this planet were designed to, to give and bear fruit. And that is organically true for you too. And when you're ready, you can come back. Very powerful. A little emotional. 
<laughs> to root into that, to feel that. Oh, very beautiful. Thank you for preparing that for us and sharing. Yeah. Gladly. Yeah, thank you. It was lovely to, just lovely to be here. And I'm visualizing in my own mind all of all of the people who are listening and um, I just, yeah. you know, it's such important work. It's so important that we take the time to have these conversations and do our own work and make connections where we are and we can do this, we can keep going, you know, we can, we have to, we have to for our kids and for whatever life survives us when we are gone, we we're here for but a time. Um, and we can do hard things for, time. you know, there will be time to rest and it may be when the lights go out on our life. But I think there's also moments of pause in between and when we remember that we're just, we're designed to give, we can just rest in that and know that if we're true to who we are, we will give because it's, that's, that's our nature. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've given your fruits today for sure in this conversation. And I know, I mean, your story is very inspiring and also resourcing for me to hear, uh, even though I've been, you know, involved in the climate work for a while now, uh, and have sort of gone through my own parallel process to what you talk about. And I know for anybody that's where I'm at or, you know, years and years ahead of me in, in climate and, and activism, work, um, you know, they'll be touched by, by your story, but also people who are looking kind of over the edge going, can I, dare I, you know, if I do, will I fall flat on my face? Will somebody be there to catch me? You know, they're going to be very touched by hearing your story and very motivated, I think, to, um, to try, to just show up and try and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's really, it's been such an adventure, <laughs> you know, yeah. and I think we're at a time where it's like, go big, go bold. Like, yeah. you know, when the, when things seem like they're falling to hell in a handbasket, like just yeah, don't like pull out all the stops because, yeah. you know, so there's two messages. One is like, relax and, you know, settle yeah. into who you are. And the other is like, just do it like yeah 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 but it's like it, it, exactly as your point is do it your style like do it yeah. like bear your fruit go big and bear your fruit like whatever your unique contribution is yeah yeah, yeah. and and really look at like what is the, the automatic programming that's going on in your mind and say like I'm not going to listen to that anymore because life's too short and for me to live out some program yeah yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. It's like, no, we're not here for that. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you again to everybody who joined us today live and um, to our listeners who will catch the replay on our YouTube channel. If you've been here with us live and you'd like to listen again, the recording will be here on the Facebook page, but also on our YouTube channel. And if you want to listen to more conversations like this, uh, this is part of a whole series of conversations with other climate coaches and other people in the psychology realm um, who are, you know, in climate, uh, conscious climate engagement and ecological re reconnection work. So go to the YouTube channel to see more of that. Um, you can follow Kelly on all of the uh, social media stuff uh, with, you're usually under Kelly Green Coaching, yeah? Kelly Green Coaching. Yeah, yeah. Kelly Green Coaching and the website's kellygreencoaching.com. So I'm sure we'll have an excuse to be together again. And I look forward to that. But until that time, thank you again so much. And we'll say goodbye to everybody listening. Bye, everybody. Bye.